Welcome to the War Academy channel. In 2022, it will be 80 years since one of the most important and most dramatic military sieges of all time, this being that of Stalingrad. The importance of this event lies in the fact that it was the biggest defeat of the German army to date, just at the moment when they believed that they had finished imposing themselves on the Soviet Union. The drama is found in the long agony that the surrounded troops endured for almost two and a half months. The continuous fighting, the cold, the lack of supplies and the false hopes mixed together, and made a perfect cocktail of suffering that tormented the encircled troops until the end. It should also be noted that once they were captured, their conditions did not improve much, and half of those men would die before the end of the winter, this total number being about 40,000. In today's program, we are going to focus on the most absurd supplies that the encircled 6th Army received in Stalingrad, and on the totally wrong view that the German High Command had about what was happening inside the city. Before we get to this point, let's do a brief recap. It all started on November 19, 1942 when the Soviets began their encirclement of Stalingrad, known as Operation Uranus. Once this concluded on the 23rd and the German troops were isolated inside the city, the encircled Germans had two options. In the first place they could try to break the fence, launching the strongest attack possible against what was now their rear, or they could remain inside the fence resisting, waiting to be released. This second option of maintaining positions was the one that was finally taken. For this, and until the German liberation troops arrived, it was necessary to establish an air bridge with Stalingrad to supply the fences. This decision, which carried many risks, was made in part because of how effective the orders to hold positions had been shown a year earlier during the Soviet counteroffensives at the end of 1941, and because of the final triumph in the Demiansk pocket. Although the conditions in Stalingrad are far from similar to those experienced during the previous winter, this was not taken into account at the time. While in Demiansk some 100,000 Germans were bagged, needing some 270 tons of supplies a day, in Stalingrad these figures tripled. Other important factors are the distance to Stalingrad and the great length of the overexploited supply line. Finally, both the power and capacity of the aviation and the Soviet Army of 1942 was also far from being the same as a year before. In any case, and even with all this, the green light was given to the operation. The initial estimates that the troops surrounded in Stalingrad were going to need were established at about 750 tons of daily supplies, although later they tried to reduce something more, until reaching 500. This was due to the fact that practically from the first day they began to reduce food rations, as well as ammunition, which in normal conditions they had to have. Far from these forecasts, it is estimated that during the 72 days that the Stalingrad siege lasted, the Luftwaffe successfully delivered 8,350 tons, making a total of only 116 per day. There were only three days in December in which it was possible to reach 300 tons per day, this figure being half of what had originally been estimated as a minimum. Starting in early January, the Soviets began strong offensives against the pocket, which gradually dwindled and had to abandon airfields, which made it even more difficult to supply them. It was specifically on January 22, when the last German airfield in Stalingrad was lost, and from that moment on, they only depended on parachuted supplies which often fell into Soviet territory. Now that this recapitulation of the global situation that this air supply entailed has been made, let us now see the strangest things that slipped into one of the planes bound for Stalingrad. Taking into account the scarcity suffered by the soldiers who were trapped in the pocket, the most logical thing, was to make the most of each shipment made to provide them, with those supplies that were most necessary. Trying to take advantage of everything possible, the limited space of planes of all kinds, which had to be used in this airlift, they stopped sending ready-made bread, and instead the flour was sent directly. This took up much less space than the bread and in this way the troops could count on more carbohydrates, if the bread was made inside the bag. After a few days, they realized that it was impossible to make bread inside the Stalingrad bag, since there were no ovens available in such quantities, much less wood to burn, since the little that remained was used for heating. 
This forced the shipment of flour to be suspended and once again, the bread already made had to be sent. As a curiosity, because the temperatures were so low, the bread would freeze and had to be chopped with axes. Another shipment that also made the troops furious was the shipment of up to five tons of candies on Christmas days, when other much more essential foods were in alarming shortage. But if even the candies could be eaten, there were other totally stupid shipments such as the cargo of a plane that landed loaded with four tons of pepper. This again caused great irritation among the German commanders of the bag, although there were some others who, using black humor, commented that at least now, they could season the dead before burying them. Another class of totally absurd shipments was a shipment with some 200,000 leaflets that with different motivating messages, intended to raise the morale of the troops. Suffice it to say that any soldier would have preferred any kind of food to those papers. And the last of the totally useless shipments worth mentioning was, a dozen boxes of condoms that the encircled German troops received. This series of shipments that we have just seen is somewhat anecdotal and in no case were they frequent, since the vast majority of supplies were of total utility and importance. However, different testimonies make us think that the critical situation that the surrounded troops were going through in the city was totally unknown by the German high command. To do this, we have to highlight a meeting held on January 13, 1943 between a young German officer who was evacuated from Stalingrad and all the generals of the German high command with Hitler at the head. This young officer named Winrich Baer, who had been decorated with the Iron Cross, left Stalingrad on January 12th with all the internal reports of the situation. His mission was to convey to Hitler the reality of the situation as truthfully as possible. Before reaching Hitler's headquarters in East Prussia, Bear's plane made a first stop at the Manstein barracks, located north of the Sea of Azov. Manstein asked him to inform him of the situation in Stalingrad. Winrich then went on to describe everything to you in great detail. The hunger, the high casualty rate, the exhaustion of the soldiers, the wounded lying in the snow with their blood frozen waiting to be evacuated, the unfortunate shortage of ammunition, fuel, and food and much more. Once I had finished describing everything, Manstein said to him, go now and present to Hitler the same description that he has given me, point by point. The next morning Bear left for the wolf's lair for the meeting. In it he met in addition to the German leader, about 25 senior officers. The young captain had already been warned that when someone came to such a conference bearing bad news, he was usually interrupted by the senior officers or the German leader himself, and not allowed to do much talking. And this was what also happened on this occasion. Shortly after starting to speak, he was interrupted and then Hitler went on to tell him about the plans they had to free the encircled troops. He commented that a large formation of Waffen SS divisions was being hurriedly mobilized, soon to be ready for an offensive in the area. Mr. Captain, when you see Paulus again, convey this message to him, and also tell him that all my heart and hopes are with him and with his army, were the words that Hitler finally said to Winrich. The young captain, aware that he had practically not been allowed to speak or give his report, insisted again and said that he was there to fulfill a mission that his commander-in-chief had given him, and that he had not yet fulfilled it. So he asked to be allowed to give his report. No one objected to these words and Bear began to relate what was happening in the fence. As he had done with man's time, he did not spare any details, including the defections that had begun to occur. While he was commenting on this, and given how offensive these words were, there was some attempt to make him shut up starring Keitel, although it was unsuccessful. When Winrich gave the numbers of the few provisions that came to him from the Lultwaffe, everyone was surprised, because the reports that came to them were much higher. These reports handled by the high command alluded to all the goods that went out, and not to those that were finally received, because that was the big difference. Finally, Captain Baer realized that all the figures on the situation of the troops in Stalingrad, handled by the German high command, were totally wrong, and had been made up to the extreme. The next morning, Winrich was called back to Hitler's presence for a closer talk without much public. In it was Field Marshal Milch, belonging to the Luftwaffe, who was urged to improve the delivery of supplies to the encircled troops. After this meeting, the captain had new interviews with other officers of a more political nature, who realized that Winrich had lost his faith and hope of victory, 
so they did not send him back to Stalingrad, so that he would not transmit the impressions who had taken Paulus to that meeting. In short, we can see that the information that they handled in the most important barracks of all, for different reasons, was far from being the real thing, and we do not know to what extent it could have influenced the sending of the absurd articles that we have previously commented on. Well, so far this curious program that I hope has been of interest to you. I recommend you watch the one we did a few weeks ago about the interrogation Paulus was subjected to by the Soviets when they captured him. You can find it in the description. We say goodbye here. Many thanks to everyone, especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, and see you in the next one. See you soon.